stress because that shear stress uh, will change the amount of stress in the in the fiber itself. And of course, when we, because we want to do dynamics, well, we put a mass term in there to reflect what's happening, that, that, that the dynamic loading will change the stress in the fiber. The way we solve this is uh, a technique in which we imagined that the UNs are coefficients of a Fourier series, which allows, uh, which allows us to multiply this equation by e to the minus i n theta, sum it from minus infinity to infinity and integrate, and move thereby from a, uh, a difference equation regime into a simple differential equation regime and solve it, and then use this uh, equation here, this reverse uh, transform to move back into what the de what the deflections are. I'm going to talk later about what happens if you take this same equation and and uh, uh, tackle it another way, which is one of the favorite ways. If you have these things spaced closely enough, well then you can say, well, you'll smear everything out and turn the whole thing into a distributed uh, kind of a continuous kind of structure, in which case this differential equation comes out to be in this form here, in the form of the wave equation. Well, here are results that we got out by doing this. And incidentally, these results were calculated by a computer. And, uh, and you have to remember, though, that these were the days in which the computer was a person. Not a machine. <laughs> and it was a person that punched a Monroe or a Marchant uh, uh, thing and, and you gave them the problem and they gave you the answers back. But you can see here that this is what dynamically happens when you have one uh, one filament broken, and two filaments broken, and three filaments broken, and you could continue the process, but it's instructive to go to the dynamic, to the smeared out distributed uh, approach in order to continue that process. And uh, it turns out that that equation, that wave equation that you looked at, is, is, and the boundary value problem that you're dealing with is the same as the equation that you get uh, for uh, the, the equations that you get, the boundary value problem that you get for supersonic flow over a, um, uh, a rectangular wing. Um, and uh, so I was able to go to Evard's solution for that particular problem in order to solve my structural dynamics problem. And, it's, and this, the reason I brought this one up is because that's an example of where you take your knowledge from one completely different field and move it into your field and get yourself uh, good answers as a result. And the results there are as you see. I'm going to skip my last example. Uh, because of time. Could you go to the last chart, please? You heard that. I'd just like to close with returning to understanding structural behavior. I think there's consequences. I might say that this, this approach has, has lasted me throughout my career, throughout my life, and has stood me in very good stead. But by understanding structural behavior, and I really mean understanding it, running a computer analysis of a structure does not mean that you understand how it behaves. You, you've got to run it uh, on a number of structures. You have to do trend studies, uh, uh, parametric studies to really understand behavior. But when you do, then you have, uh, then you do better conceptual and preliminary design. Many of the things that I'm doing, that I've been doing for the past 10 years are things that is very difficult to do experiment on. And I feel that I need to talk um, um, uh, in a correct fashion about what could happen if we built them. And in order to do so, I feel that you have to take on a big responsibility of putting in there what, your, what a real understanding of that structure would be. When you do it, you get more accurate, less expensive, detailed structural finite element analysis. I don't say the finite element analysis is not needed, it certainly is. 
you get fewer surprises during acceptance tests or qualification tests, and which incidentally those of us who have been through it know that's the worst possible time to get surprises is during those tests because it's immensely expensive, and you are, are yielded a more reliable structure. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Gentlemen, ladies, I'll have to start off by uh, an ad lib comment here that a lot of the notions that I might bring out here are similar or overlap some of the notions that John just made. And you might wonder as you listen whether that is because we were brought up under the same environment. It might have had something to do with it. It's a privilege to be considered along with the distinguished researchers that are brought together here. Memories go back quite a number of years. I came here as a civil engineer to work under Lundquist, who's going to be our next speaker. With many of the distinguished guests, we played softball, basketball, football together, even ate at the same boarding houses even played poker together at lunchtime using paper clips as poker chips. There's a thing that I've noticed that some commonality even between the speakers at this group, they're all, all white-haired, bald, with the one exception of Bob Jones, who has black hair, and I don't know how he can keep his youth up like that. <clears throat> All the experts, our people here are experts in their own right. And that reminds me of one of the definitions of an expert. An expert is a person who can look at a rumpled bed and tell whether it was for love or money. <laughs> whether these folks are this kind of expert or not, I don't know. <laughs> I've been on the road a lot recently. I haven't been able to open my mail or take telephone calls. And at a recent meeting, someone went, mentioned to me, I see you are on the Distinguished Lecture Program. I was surprised I said, I am? I hadn't even realized it. <clears throat> I've just gotten back. I prepared my talk last night. So it's going to be mostly an ad lib or off the cup cuff type of talk. My view graphs actually were made just this morning. Also, I recently moved from my office. All my papers and books are packed in boxes now. I can't help but make the notion or observation that you've just heard that Nixon has about 1,500,000 pieces of paper. He's beaten me. I have only about a million. <laughs> So all the comments that I'm going to make today are mostly from memory. I'm going to talk mainly on individual research. I'll try to be objective, but it's based upon subjective experience. I'm not going to talk about such aspects as management, although good management is part of successful research. 
We tacitly assume resources are available. We have the manpower, the funds, facilities. Now let's go through a number of items that I feel are ingredients or related to successful research. They are in the nature of lessons learned. If I had more time to think about it and had one more night, I'm sure I could double or triple the list, but we'll confine it to the items that I've indicated on the subsequent slides. As you've seen from the program, that is the title of my talk, looking for some of the approaches or elements that I have found throughout the years have been leading to successful research. <clears throat> There are various kinds of research approaches. We've heard them couched under various terms, push-pull, basic or generic, developmental, troubleshooting. I'm not gonna to try to make a distinction between those as I go through the talk, but I think you might find examples of each one of those as we go along. If there's one item I'd like to single out, I think it's one of the most important of all in doing successful research, and that is to get involved. Consume yourself with it. Understand the problem. Get so excited about it that you don't want to go home at night time. That you can't wait to get back to work in the morning. Now, of course, this doesn't make brownie points with your wife, but it's a very important ingredient to get very, very involved in what you're doing. Understand it. Now, I'm gonna make a little side comment here. <clears throat> And that's about all I want to make on management. It deals with management of research. I am totally opposed to have managers go to management school that teach you that they can manage any product without even knowing what the product is. That might be all right if you're going to make nuts and bolts. But with sophisticated system and high technology, and particularly research, this doesn't apply in my mind. The managers must understand the problem just like the researchers. There are some very fundamental approaches that you should take. And incidentally, there's going to probably be a lot of typographical errors in my view graphs since they were just made this morning. I haven't had a chance to review them, and I think I see one already. <clears throat> when you approach a problem, and we'll assume that you're complete in the dark, one of the first things you should do is apply first principles. Do some dimensional type of analysis. If it's a highly nonlinear problem, linearize it to establish the basic parameters. Try to get a first order approximation to your answer. For example, this linearization to establish basic parameters may give you a key as to how you should couch your final exact data and make it all condensed in a nice uniform way. I found this more and more useful in many, many of the projects that I've encountered. As I go through these slides, I'm gonna go through them rather quickly because I think they sort of illustrate some of the points that I um, wish to make. Expect the unexpected. We had established what we called an interaction curve in the Structures Research Laboratory, where we consider a panel acted upon by two stresses, a stress in one direction and a stress at 90 degrees to this. And that led to the curve on top of the slide, and it showed that there's a certain combination of these two stresses that would lead to buckling of the panel. And the notion of this slide is that we now have established a preconceived notion of how a structure ought to behave. <clears throat> a very nice result, verified by experiment. But then we can introduce the next problem, and this is a problem that Dr. Stoll, Dr. Batdorf, and I worked on. <clears throat> This was the situation similar to the web in a wing spar where you had an axial stress due to bending and a shear stress. What was the interaction curve for this kind of phenomenon? Well, we worked out the theory and we were getting answers that didn't quite make sense. And in those days, a computer was a girl upstairs who pushed the Fredont and Marchant machine and it often took days before we even got a single point. We were getting answers similar to the curve shown on the bottom, and the points 
that are indicated here. On the basis of this, we said there's something wrong. It doesn't seem to be behaving properly. Because we had a preconceived notion that perhaps the curve ought to come down monotonically just like this one did. So we rechecked our analysis, re-evaluated our points, but couldn't come up with a possible solution. And finally it occurred to us that maybe something was happening in a discontinuous way. Now the theory was pretty high powered to begin with, very involved mathematics. But now we start have to, start have to examine this theory from a discontinuous behavior point of view. Well, this is the sort of thing I like very much. <clears throat> to bring to bear the high-powered mathematics to study problems of this sort. And very shortly, we did discover and could prove that the answer should come out in a discontinuous way. And in that way, we verified the fact that the curves were coming out all right. Indeed, it went along this way, and then we had a discontinuous behavior here. That curve then became the subsequent curve for use in design of spar webs for aircraft design. Totally unexpected result. Be alert for a new phenomenon. These are research problems that come about after a system is in being. An unexpected results come into play. Now you have to do the research to d try to explain why that happened. I'm going to give you about three examples on this. One of them dealt with the X-15 airplane. During one of its landings, it broke in half as depicted over here. And of course, the immediate mystery, why should this happen? Somehow I was brought into the problem I began to analyze it. Applied first some first principles, then went into a little bit more detailed theory and everything, and finally discovered that this was happening. The X-15 would come down at a rather high angle of attack. The rear gear would hit, and there would be a load developed, as you might expect. It would then go into a rotational kind of mode where the nose gear would hit. And <clears throat> on the surface, you felt the landing was complete. The rear gear had touched down, the nose gear had touched down, and the airplane was designed accordingly. But the analysis that they came up with indicated that this wasn't the complete picture. What they had done was good to that point, but the actual arresting hadn't really been finished. The analysis indicate that there was, in a sense, a second reaction to the rear gear, which was even more severe than the original reaction. And of course, the two forces that developed here were very intimately de determined by the spacing of the gear in relationship to the radius of gyration of the inertia of the airplane itself. But the results indicated, yes, there is a more severe load, the airplane should have cracked up, and therefore we use the analysis then to subsequently redesign the gear and the fuselage of the X-15 airplane, and subsequent landings were successful. The Electra, a couple of them fell out of the skies and a completely unknown reason why. And this <clears throat> was really a very mysterious kind of problem. There was a little bit of evidence that maybe the engine had been shaking before it pulled off and pulled the wing with it, but very, very flimsy kind of evidence. <clears throat> Somehow it was brought into bear on this problem, and the thought occurred that maybe we had some sort of an unknown flutter kind of phenomenon here. Now this is a phenomenon that had been pointed out some years ago, many, many years ago, by a person I believe by the name of Taylor, but systems were built so that the phenomenon would never occur, therefore it was never really considered further. This readdressed the problem, and now we have a tremendously complicated dynamic system that interacts with aerodynamics. We noticed that the nacelle itself could have flexibility both in the pitch direction and yaw direction. The electrons were carrying enormous blades that had a tremendous amount of inertia and could influence the aerodynamics very, very strongly. So I began to wonder if we had a situation here 
that could actually be a flutter type of phenomenon. This is a true aeroelastic problem. Now the system itself is very complicated because it's a rotating mass. We have gyroscopic forces coupling with kind of stiffnesses, and then we have an interaction of aerodynamics. Yes, Jack, we didn't have the aerodynamics for a rotating, vibrating propeller. So one of the things of the theory is I had to sit down and work out the non-steady aerodynamics for this kind of situation. I coupled it together with the dynamic of the situation and indeed showed that with certain stiffnesses here in the pitch and yaw direction, the system could flutter with catastrophic results. At the same time, Bill Reed came along and was making small models that would demonstrate the phenomenon also. And this is another point that I can make as an aside here. I believe it's like John was saying. You must couple together theory and experiment in a very careful way and try to make your experiments as simple as possible to demonstrate the phenomenon. I developed the theory. It explained why the electrons fell out of the sky, and it was a theory that was used then for the subsequent redesign and retrofitting of all the Electra airplanes. The Scout vehicle, when it was one of the first launches, they ran into an anomaly with the payload after it was separated from the launch vehicle itself. Something was wrong. Now it was a new phenomenon. We couldn't really know. We didn't really know what it was because we didn't have, didn't anticipate it. We didn't have instrumentation on the vehicle, and so it was a t another one of these tremendously difficult troubleshooting type problems. <clears throat> Bob Siemens asked me to look into the problem, and I began to make an analysis of it. And during separation, this is a spinning body which is then separated from the scout vehicle. So again, we have a very complicated dynamic system, a spinning. Spinning bottom that has six degrees of freedom. I started to work on theory on this and found that if you have an eccentric impulse and apply it to a spinning body, you could cause it to wobble or go into a coning type motion. I also demonstrated that by means of a very simple experiment. I took a simulated payload hung it from the ceiling and spun it, and then tried to release it as if it were being separated from the body. And sure enough, invariably, as the body was dropping, the spinning, it would go into a tremendous conical motion. Remember bringing Floyd Thompson over there to have him observe the results of this. And he looked at it and says, well, I'll be damned. Again, this was a theory combined with a simple experiment that described why we had this separation problem. The elements of how you troubleshoot the problem like this is very, very difficult, but it was the analysis that was subsequently used for a redesign of the complete separation mechanism on the scout vehicle. The answer must be simple. Notice I put up should to begin with, but I throw it out and make it almost like a law. The answer must be simple. I've just given up a, a few examples of stress in a beam, of course Newton's law, one of Newton's law, and Einstein's law. <clears throat> this reminds me that a few years ago, some commemorative stamps were put out that honored the 10 most significant equations in physics. Two of the equations were Newton's law and Einstein's law. They had also included the heat radiation law, electromagnetic radiation law, wavelength, and the like. And it's significant to note that these 10 equations have had some of the most profound effect upon the scientific community and mankind, but they were all of a very elementary nature. And I feel that all answers should turn out basically simple. I found this also, that often when you make simplifying assumptions, you all actually complicate the answers. Because I've noticed in many times that I've made simplification to get a first order answer, but then as I relax the assumptions, a lot of terms start canceling and the answer actually condenses. And then when you do it all right, you get a very, very simple answer. 
So it's a little lesson that you should learn that if you get an answer, and many of these problems, we used to have the joke that we worked them out on butcher paper. We do such a long equation. Now, if you do it right, you can work the whole thing on a half a page. And it's a very interesting kind of result that you should keep in mind. Consider history. Consider other fields. Couch new findings in familiar form. For years, we touched upon the gust response of aircraft on the assumption the airplane had been encountering discrete gusts. A standard kind of answer came out in this form. I won't go through all the terms, but the acceleration felt by the airplane was governed by this equation, where this is just a combination of airplane parameters. K was an alleviation factor that took into account non-steady aerodynamics, again, Jack, aeroelasticity, and the fact that the airplane had motion, and U was gust intensity. About this time, we saw some developments taking place in the communication fields, in the electrical fields, where they were adapting the powerful th new theorems associated with power spectral te density techniques. Harry Press said maybe there ought to be an application of these new techniques, the power spectral density techniques, to gust loads. Because in a sense, gust loads encounter is a random kind of phenomenon. And these new, this new approach is ideally suited for that. So I got very heavily involved in that and found that by applying power spectral density approach to the gust encounter problem, I got results that were identical in form to the discrete gust results shown here. The only difference is instead of using limiting values here, the answers were now couched in RMS value. RMS value of response, RMS value of gust input. So there is a lot to be learned by gathering the powerful tools of other fields, keeping in mind the basic findings that you've already established. I'm gonna come back to this equation at the end to show you an even simpler one. At the same time, I'd like to make the side comment here that once we start applying these power spectral density techniques, it sort of, the word sort of spread around throughout industry. We got a new method that solves the whole gust load problem. And then it was, and people began touting it that way. What they lost, and, and it gave the wrong impression that now we had a, an answer that was a panacea, a solution to everything, but this was really not the case. What the power spectral approach did for us is allowed us to so attack the problem in a much more elegant way, a much more rational way, and would take into account such things as wing bending flexibility in a much more appropriate way than we could here before. <clears throat> we still had to have judgment with respect to design application that is setting margins and what limit load factors are and everything like that. It didn't solve those problems. It simply gave you a better answer to lead up to the spec values. I'll come back to that equation. Consider the whole system. Understand the sensibilities. I've depicted the whole system is here is composed of three components, A, B, and C. There's a tendency for a lot of people to work on, say, one component C and optimize it to the hilt without considering what effect this optimization has had upon the entire system. My point is here, you must consider the whole system when you consider improvements in any one of the components to see whether there's an overall improvement. Let me indicate some of the results by the chart on the bottom here. We assume that we'll make a 10% improvement in a given parameter, such as a 10% reduction in the weight of the wing, or a 10% improvement in the specific fuel consumption, and then ask how much have we improved the gasoline mileage? Let me just put it in terms of that simple terminology. We see if we reduce the wing weight, the fuselage weight, the tail weight, or the gear weight by 10%, the percentage improvement in gasoline mileage is in the noise level. Very, very small improvements to be gained. If we improve the specific fuel consumption by 
increase the aspect ratio by 10%, or reduce the zero lift drag by 10%, we get tremendous improvements relative to these in the gasoline mileage. The chart has two basic messages. If you have limited resources or funding, where are you gonna spend your money? You're gonna spend the money over here where you have the greatest payoffs. Or it tells you it says do not work on these problems. It simply says don't look for 1% or half a percent gain over here. Look for really major gains like 25%, 30% improvement in reduction of weight before you realize appreciable improvements over here. So it's not saying don't work on the problem. It just gives you an indication that you really have to work hard to get good improvements. Consider the whole system. Understand the sensitivities. This was a typographical error that I happened to catch. Listen to the talk is not right. It simply says, listen to people, talk to people. Interchange your ideas. <clears throat> you often get in a position where you don't know where to go from here. By interchange of ideas, it may give you a little notion that you haven't thought of before for you to proceed to a much more successful end. The simple message is listen and talk to people about how they view the problem, what their experience is. You gain a lot of new insight by doing that. We should keep in mind that a necessary output of research is the report. And the message here is write simple reports. There's one thing that I learned from Lundquist, and he was a great person for this, of how you rep write reports well. You know, we've all heard of the notion, it's easy to write 50 pages, but it's very difficult to put the same information into five pages. But this is an essential ingredient to successful report writing, is to say only essential. And he had a simple little formula that's sort of obvious, but people forget it. Follow this and you'll make a very good report. What is the problem? What did you do about it? What are the results? Just follow that simple formula and you'll write a good report. Keep out all the shaft, skim the cream, only get find the wheat. Don't go into great details about all your efforts that failed. That's not really important. The only time that might be important is if a lot of other people are doing the same thing and you indicate, I follow this line of attack, it doesn't work, this is a better. That may be a little bit of education to other people. But keep your report writing simple. <clears throat> I'd like to talk a little bit about the pitfalls that you run into in doing research. And I've run into this many, many times, where you get so charged up with something, you don't want to go at home at night. When you get home at night, you start working all again. And you find often that you run into dark alleys, blind ends, and the message is, after a succession of unsuccessful attempts, put the work aside for a while. Forget about it, do something else, then come back, start afresh with a possible new mind or new approach in mind. In mind. The point is that if you try to keep going with unsuccessful attempts, there's a tendency for your mind to get channeled. Your vision gets very narrow and you make the same mistakes over, you start the same way again, put it aside, then come back with a fresh approach and you come in from another direction and you might find that the whole thing opens up to you. Think positive. Don't look for reasons why it can't work. Sorry, I'll make two little stories associated with that. When I was a division chief, we ran into a problem. I used to bring several people in here and say, we got a problem here. What can we do about it? Now, all these guys were smart people, but the first thing they would do is tell me all the reasons why it couldn't be solved. And it took me a couple of sessions before I realized this was happening, so then I took a different approach. I brought them in and I said, now look, don't tell me why it can't work. 
give me possible reasons how it can work, no matter how ridiculous the notion is. And by gosh, that turned around and many problems we were solved almost immediately because some crazy notion would all of a sudden be the key to the solution. One of the specific examples of that is when we ran into the runway roughness problem. We started saying, well, how can we measure runway roughness? What's the response of the aircraft to it and everything? A whole bunch of notions were considered, very complicated, costly machines. <clears throat> but falling back on my civil engineering experience, I said, look, why don't you just take a level, an ordinary civil engineering level and a yard and a stick and go measure the ru runway every foot. They thought, oh, that's crazy. I said, go do it. We went out here in Langley, measured the runways out here. Next, we were up in Washington, D.C., measuring theirs. Next, we were at Idlewild. And very shortly, we were asked all around the country to come and measure their runways. And they proved to be some of the most successful measurements of runway roughness that were in existence. Very simple approach, in spite of the fact people said it was ridiculous. And it also mixed very nicely with discrete pothole analysis or power spectral analysis. Very powerful approach. <clears throat> Beware of traps. Don't fool yourself. This is a lesson that not only we run into in times, but industry himself. We had the airplanes built out of 24 ST. We find a new miraculous material, 75 ST, allows a growth 50% greater than the 25 ST. So they build an airplane, the M202. It began to fall out of the skies. What was forgotten here is yes, we had a much better material from a static stress allowables, but they forgot completely about the fatigue performance. The fatigue performance was no better than 24ST. Therefore, even though the airplane had stronger materials in it, it would fail quicker because it had less material in it. So we got to keep that in mind that it's not just one element that's designed the airplane. It crosses the board with a lot of different considerations. Continuing with pitfalls, I see this happen so much. Consider the influence of the facility. It's astounding that around even this field with millions of wind tunnels, we don't even understand the flow within the wind tunnels. <clears throat> the distortion to the input to a model, the noise or random or turbulence within the tunnel and how it's affecting results. Main point is we should understand what the facility is doing to the phenomenon that we are measuring and try to extract that as best we can. That's often not done. Be honest. Be scientifically honest. There are many ideas that are being touted that say there are great improvements, but when you look at them, they're not, and they're being touted as uh, something important, but the person has a good salesman, he pushes the idea, but when, if you really examine it, it doesn't have the substance that the person claims it to be, and we have to be careful about that. I mentioned a little bit about code verification here, and um, some of the computer people in the audience are not gonna like what I say here. Code verification now, has led to a new phenomenon. Before we said, we, we, we've heard the notion that codes are now going to take the place of wind tunnels. But what we run into now is a situation, we have codes that are developed like mad, but now we have the notion that we need facilities to check the codes. <clears throat> And we also see the phenomenon happening that we have new computers coming online every day, every week. And what we have here is a waiting line. The pe a person has a code, he goes to this computer, gets on a waiting line because all other people want to get on it there, simply to see whether he can put his code, program his code for that computer. It takes a long time for him to program and ring out all the, uh, the bugs in it. Then a new computer comes along and he gets in the waiting line for that. That's really not doing research. That's only trying to see whether he can apply his code and make it work faster. We gotta keep, be careful of this kind of pitfall.
the usefulness of facilities or a theory might come out in unexpected ways. And I'd like to give two examples of that. Way back when we designed the landing roads track, primarily to study the impact landing problem of an airplane. It served this useful purpose. Then all of a sudden we found new uses for it. Check out tires, check out tires for shimmy, check it out grooved runways, which has had a tremendous impact across the country. That's where the grooved runway idea came into being. Check out different landing surfaces, check out landing skids. And it became such a useful facility, even though we thought it had only a one-time application, that it has been recently renovated and expanded in performance. Let's take the LEM landing facilities that we see right over here. A one-time facility to check the terminal phase of the landing of the lunar module. Oddly enough, it's like you were gonna mothball it after, a freak hurricane went through Pennsylvania and wiped out 50 of the airplanes from the Piper Aircraft Corporation. They were useless. Somebody came up with the notion, look, maybe we can use this facility, take these airplanes, and investigate the crash airworthiness of aircraft. And it's been used that way for the past 10 years in a very successful program. New ideas are not readily accepted. <clears throat> I simply pick up, point out here the picture of a twin fuselage airplane that I wrote an article about a couple of years ago, showing that by going to a twin fuselage concept, we could almost double the gasoline mileage without reliance upon any, in, any increase in technology whatsoever. But, to sell this idea to people is almost impossible. And there's an under, uh, understandable reason why. First, companies don't want to accept it because it's something that was not invented in that company. Plus, the other aspect, the companies are having hard enough time as it is to sell their own airplanes. Plus, the companies, and particularly the commercial ones, have to guarantee their product to a 1% or half a percent. If they don't, the company can go broke. Well, it's very difficult for them to take a new concept like this and guarantee it to 1%. And that's the reason, one of the reasons why they stay away from it. But I have full confidence in the next 10 years, you will see an airplane of this type come out in some unexpected way. Now, if RT is still here, I want to indicate that in the paper I wrote, I indicated another version of this, which was the, the oblique twin fuselage airplane. That is worth considering. Now, it doesn't have a lower drag as RT's configuration, but it can land, it will not overhang the runways, and Max, it has windows that bother you. <laughs> New notions may take a long time to be accepted. I'm coming back to the equation that I mentioned earlier. The basic equation for gust response of an airplane encountering turbulence. We have used this form for years, and in a way we get locked into something that may keep us from doing, in a, doing something and finding a more simple result, because we've always used this combination of parameters occurred to me, says, can I do something about it? Now this K, K is a very complicated function. I won't go into the description of how it's obtained here. I said, but isn't there some reason, way I can get rid of K, and isn't there some reason I can get rid of V? One of the problems of the, using this airplane is, I mean this equation, is that when you design an airplane, you have to consider different altitudes of flight, different weights of the airplane, different velocities, and so it's a big question, it's an art, which ones are the right combination to design the airplane? So I said, there ought to be some way of simplifying that equation. Well, I did a lot of juggling, and lo and behold, wham, it all collapsed to the equation shown here. A very elementary equation. The design load for gust is simply these couple of factors, and alpha is nothing more than the angle of the attack of the airplane to maintain level flight. It automatically takes into account all conditions of flight of the airplane, altitude, speed, weight, and now I submit this as the 11th equation that is of the simple form. <laughs> Coming close to the end now, 
What do we do with a good idea that nobody wants? And I'm referring here to the use of Lunar Orbit Rendezvous and LIM in the Apollo program. I won't go through the whole history of this at the moment because it would take three hours to explain some of the interesting intrigues and history of it. But the general reaction is they didn't want to hear about it. And there was understandable reason. They were too busy with other problems or their comments would say you're crazy or they would have to keep in mind there is this business of NIH not invented here kind of syndrome. <clears throat> so. What do you do about a situation like that where you feel inwardly this is the only way a situation is going to work without making a nuisance of yourself? And that's a difficult thing. I cannot give you a complete recipe because every situation is different. But I can just offer a couple notions off the head. Try different avenues. Try different channels. Then ask yourself, well, maybe you're wrong. Check yourself. Put your put the results in a different form. Maybe maybe you're just kidding yourself about what you have. Try to persist without being obnoxious. Talk with the people that are working down there. Maybe they'll be sympathetic. Maybe by the time management hears about it and they come down and check with the what do you think about this idea? Oh, that's a good idea. But equally important. Try to do things that make the people themselves feel that they discovered the idea, and then the idea will sell. <clears throat> it's an interesting thing after going through this entire history that I got inundated with all sorts of inquiries that I just labeled under cookie inventions. I put a file away from that, and they, the people would come along sort of, <clears throat> look, you've been through this problem. I have a good idea, but I can't get anywhere with it. What can I do with it? And it's a difficult chore to answer every one of these questions because some of the notions that are presented to you do smack upon kookiness because they use mixed up terminology and everything that makes no sense at all. And you get all gradations. Then you say, well, there is a possibility this might work. Then there's something that says, well, it's too bad that this hasn't been looked into further. So it's a difficult thing to answer those questions. But with respect to all this now, I want to point out two important factors. That sometimes really important products don't happen until the right time is there or the right place. With respect to Apollo, there are two basic things that happened. One, Ron Brown and his propulsion people showed that propulsion problem could be solved. The MIT Navigation Laboratory worked the navigation and guidance problem. And then we had to have the proper plan, which is the basis of all this up here. And it dealt with energy management. The right plan was the LOR and LEM concept. These three things made the whole Apollo project possible with these additional factors. We had a dedicated nation. We had a focused effort, funding was there, and we had a commitment. It was the greatest mobilization of resources that I've seen, we've all seen, with respect to effort, funding, manpower, and we accomplished the job in a very remarkable short time. From beginning where we knew absolutely nothing to the landing on the moon accomplished within seven years. And that's a remarkable contrast since we have to keep in mind that to develop any new aircraft engine takes at least, at least seven years. <clears throat> so it was a all these things must fall in place in order for something like that to happen. I'd like to wind up with a couple little observations. For myself, I like to change fields. I'm not saying that this is a notion that applies to everybody. And I found that it's easy to change fields as long as you've learned the fundamentals. When I came here, I was a civil engineer and I started working on structures and materials. Then I went to vibration and dynamics of structures. Then I got involved in landing loads, gust loads on airplanes, how you characterize atmospheric turbulence, how you describe the behavior of an airplane in atmospheric turbulence, how you design it. Then I got into air elastic problems like the Hedgepath mentioned, flutter. All this
this is a self-learning, self-education process. When I left college, I had courses in civil engineering. The closest thing to aerodynamics I had was one course in hydrodynamics. I didn't know a thing about aerodynamics. So you must continually self-educate yourself in all these things. From the and then I went into the acoustics problem. Then the space age came along. I got involved in orbital mechanics, launch vehicle designs, space mission planning, communication satellites, navigation and guidance. Then subsequent years, I got into boundary layer aspects. Then in more recent years, the shuttle problems, the tile problems, the launch loads, the ascent loads, the behavior of the shuttle in winds, and then more recently, more or less completed the circle, gotten very heavily involved with the aircraft design as a system. And so, to me, it is worthwhile considering to change fields every five years or something like that. And it's easy to do if you learn the fundamentals. I wind up with the notion, you know, and usually they say in a talk, you get up and say, Tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them, and then tell them what you told them. I'm going to avoid that last thing here, but I'm going to simply make the end up with the observation that in research, you've got to keep in mind that research often raises more questions than it answers. Thank you, gentlemen. because that shear stress uh, uh, will change the amount of stress in the, in the fiber itself. And of course, when we, because we want to do dynamics, well, we put a mass term in there to reflect what's happening, that, that, that the dynamic loading will change the stress in the fiber. The way we solve this is uh, a technique in which we imagined that the UNs are coefficients of a Fourier series, which allows uh, which allows us to multiply this equation by e to the minus i n theta, sum it for minus infinity to infinity, and integrate, and move thereby from a uh, a difference equation regime into a simple differential equation regime and solve it, and then use this uh, equation here, this reverse. Uh, transform to move back into what the, what the deflections are. I'm going to talk later about what happens if you take this same equation and, and uh, uh, tackle it another way, which is one of the favorite ways. If you have these things spaced closely enough, well then you can say, well, you'll smear everything out and turn the whole thing into a distributed uh, kind of a continuous kind of structure, in which case this differential equation comes out to be in this form here, the form of the wave equation. Well, here are results that we got out by doing this. And incidentally, these results were calculated by a computer. And, uh, and you have to remember, though, that these were the days in which the computer was a person not a machine. <laughs> and it was a person that punched a Monroe or a Marchant uh, uh, thing and, and you gave them the problem and they gave you the answers back. But you can see here that this is what dynamically happens when you have one uh, one filament broken, and two filaments broken, and three filaments broken, and you could continue the process, but it's instructive to go to the dynamic, to the smeared out distributed uh, approach in order to continue that process. And uh, it turns out that that equation, that wave equation that you looked at, is, is, and the boundary value problem that you're dealing with is the same as the equation that you get uh, for uh, the, the equations that you get, the boundary value problem that you get for supersonic flow over a, um, uh, a rectangular wing. Um, and uh, so I was able to go 
to Evard's solution for that particular problem in order to solve my structural dynamics problem. And, it's, and this, the reason I brought this one up is because that's an example of where you take your knowledge from one completely different field and move it into your field and get yourself uh, good answers as a result. And the results there are as you see. I'm going to skip my last example uh, because of time. Could you go to the last chart, please? You heard that. I'd just like to close with returning to understanding structural behavior. I think there's consequences. I might say that this, this approach has, has lasted me throughout my career, throughout my life, and has stood me in very good stead. Thank you, Nick. Gentlemen, ladies, I'll have to start off by an ad lib comment here that a lot of the notions that I might bring out here are similar or overlap some of the notions that John just made. And you might wonder as you listen whether that is because we were brought up under the same environment. It might have had something to do with it. It's a privilege to be considered along with the distinguished researchers that are brought together here. Memories go back quite a number of years. I came here as a civil engineer to work under Lundquist, who's going to be our next speaker. With many of the distinguished guests, we played softball, basketball, football together, even ate at the same boarding houses even played poker together at lunchtime using paper clips as poker chips. There's a thing that I've noticed that some commonality even between the speakers at this group. But by understanding structural behavior, and I really mean understanding it, running a computer analysis of a structure does not mean that you understand how it behaves. You, you've got to run it uh, on a number of structures. You have to do trend studies, uh, uh, parametric studies to really understand behavior. But when you do, then you have, uh, then you do better conceptual and preliminary design. Many of the things that I'm doing, that I've been doing for the past 10 years, are things that is very difficult to do experiment on. And I feel that I need to talk um, um, uh, uh, in a correct fashion about what could happen if we built them. And in order to do so, I feel that you have to take on a big responsibility of putting in there what your, what a real understanding of that structure would be. When you do it, you get more accurate, less expensive, detailed structural finite element analysis. I don't say the finite element analysis is not needed, it certainly is. You get fewer surprises during acceptance tests or qualification tests, in which incidentally those of us who have been through it know that's the worst possible time to get surprises is during those tests because it's immensely expensive and you are, are yielded a more reliable structure. Thank you.
with the one exception of Bob Jones, who has black hair, and I don't know how he can keep his youth up like that. <clears throat> All the experts, or people here, are experts in their own right. And that reminds me of one of the definitions of an expert. An expert is a person who can look at a rumpled bed and tell whether it was for love or money. <clears throat> whether these folks are this kind of expert or not, I don't know. <clears throat> I've been on the road a lot recently. I haven't been able to open my mail or take telephone calls. And at a recent meeting, someone went, mentioned to me, I see you are on the Distinguished Lecture Program. I was surprised I said, I am? I hadn't even realized it. <clears throat> I've just gotten back. I prepared my talk last night. So it's going to be mostly an ad lib or off the cup cuff type of talk. My view graphs actually were made just this morning. Also, I recently moved from my office. All my papers and books are packed in boxes now. I can't help but make the notion or observation that you've just heard that Nixon has about 1,500,000 pieces of paper. He's beaten me. I have only about a million. <laughs> So all the comments I'm going to make today are mostly from memory. I'm going to talk mainly on individual research. I'll try to be objective, but it's based upon subjective experience. 